Hey everyone and welcome back or welcome if you are new. So hi, I'm gonna keep this intro as quick as possible because I am just stressed and I need this to be over. Okay, so I did this thing on October this month where I was gonna read three vlogs. No, I was not gonna read the vlogs. I was gonna read three books for three separate dedicated vlogs. Now, I should have formally announced this, but I have this bad luck thing in my freaking life. When I announce something, I end up not doing it. Hence the rarity of TBR videos, because whenever I'm like, I'm gonna read this book, it just never happens. Okay, so I did the vlogs without telling anyone, and I am kind of-ish succeeding-ish in a successful way. I'm making literally no sense, but it's been a long fucking day, and please bear with my soul and my being, thank you. So this month I was like, I'm gonna do three standalone vlogs. One of them is gonna be a reread of a book that I have loved in the past, a horror book, and I'm gonna see whether or not it is that good or if I was just a dumbass before. So that was Cows by Matthew Stucco. All right, the second one was me reading a popular horror book that I haven't read before. If you're wondering why I'm shouting, it's because the dogs are barking outside and I don't wanna refilm this, so I'm trying to enunciate over them. I'm trying to speak over them so you don't hear them because I don't want to have to refilm this. So if I'm being obnoxious, I am naturally obnoxious and you're at the wrong fucking channel. Anyway, so the other one was going to be a popular horror book that I have not read yet. So that was The Shining by Stephen King. I did that vlog. And now is the grand finale-ish. It's not that special. It's something I did for me to satiate my soul and craving for the genre that I am a huge fan of, horror, the best genre ever, and smut, and thrillers. If you're a fan of either of those, I think we should be friends. Please subscribe. Thank you very much. Okay, so the grand finale is going to be a classic horror book that I have not read yet that I want to read. So it was a toss-up between Dracula and Flowers in the Attic, but I was like, you know what, I like real horror, like horror in the real people realm. Like, although I'm sure Dracula is a fantastic book, I'm just not in the mood to read about vampires right now. We're not gonna do that. So I chose to read Flowers in the Attic by V.C. Andrews. I've got a physical copy of this, which you're gonna see in the vlog, but it's downstairs and I really just can't be helped to get it right now. <laughs> so just keep watching and you'll see her. So with that being said, this vlog is going to have spoilers, though the big spoilers are going to be at the very end, and I will warn you. This book is very deliberately paced in how not much happens for about 80% of the book. I mean, stuff does happen, but it is very predictable given what the synopsis of the book is. We follow these four kids who are locked in an attic because their dad died. The mom had to support them somehow, so she moved in with her parents, who she was previously estranged from because of something sinful she did. A large chunk of this book is just them in the attic and us seeing them gradually deteriorate because of abuse. So I do get into that in this vlog, and I don't really consider that to be spoilers because it's basically the premise of this book. But the main twist, which I'm sure we all know, but for those of you few who have not, I will keep it at the very end, okay? So if you've not read this book, feel free to watch this and just dip by the end. But if you're familiar with this book and you know where the story goes, I don't think anything in this video will be a massive surprise to you. So we're gonna see if Flowers in the Attic is good or garbage. Um, with that being said, enjoy the vlog. Okay, hey everyone, my hair may be a freaking mess, but hopefully this next read is not. And this next read is gonna be Flowers in the Attic by V.C. Andrews. I'm about to start this now. Also, I've got some Starbucks. Okay, this is a grande iced caramel macchiato with an extra pump of caramel syrup, and it is delicious, okay? Listen to me here. I don't know where you are in the world, but I feel like this advice is gonna be universal. If you get an iced caramel macchiato, and don't put in that extra caramel syrup pump. It will taste like literal milk, okay? Don't do that to yourself. Everyone, you need to just learn to treat yourself right in the world. Okay, so cheers to that. I actually tried to read this book early last year and I never finished it, I DNF'd it. I was listening to the audiobook and it was crap, okay? The narrator 
sounded like the narrator in House Across the Lake, if you know what I mean. An 80 year old woman who smokes 50 packs a day of cigarettes and cigars and drugs, okay? So I was like, there's no way I can listen to this bullshit. So I picked up the physical book. We're gonna be physically reading this. I've got my bookmark and I'm gonna start now and I will check in soon. A few moments later. All right, so let me just start by saying that the book is so beautifully written. I love this prose. V.C. Andrews, you did good. Also, by the way, um, I got the physical copy because it was quite cheap and it contained both flowers in the attic and petals in the wind which is the sequel to the first book and if I just so happen to be super hooked I can just jump right into book two and have a physical copy here with me without having to go to the bookstore, place a reservation, go on Amazon, yada yada yada, all that stuff, right? In this book we follow this girl named Kathy. I think this is her from the future writing this letter to us, the reader, documenting this very hard childhood she has. She was like, I changed the names, but the horrificness that happened was retained in these pages, okay? So basically, the book opens up with this beautiful description of this beautiful family, the Dollingers, Dollingers. It's hard to pronounce, okay? I forgot how it was said. I'm too lazy to freaking Google. So we see this beautiful description of this beautiful family. You've got this mom named Corinne, this dad named Chris, Kathy, and Chris. And we open up by hearing that she is daddy's little girl, that they have a very close relationship, that all the family gets along, and that it's overall just a really good vibe in this beautiful suburban little house of theirs. They love the neighbors, they have friends, they have a good life. And one day we learn that the mom, Corinne, is pregnant with twins. And we get this very heartbreaking description of Kathy feeling like she's no longer gonna be the object of her parents' eye. She's like, oh, I was the baby in this family. I don't want you to have more babies. Like, what the fuck is this? But then the dad tells her in secret, like, you'll always be my favorite daughter. So obviously she's daddy's little girl. Her relationship with her father is one that's very beautiful, one that's been healthily cultivated throughout her whole life. They're very close, she loves her mom, she looks up to her older brother. Eventually when the mom gives birth and the twins come out, they all get along, right? Now one day the dad is taking very long to get home and we learned that this is because he had gotten into a car accident, okay? So the dad's dead, the mom is a single mom now, and we learn that a lot of the house stuff and a lot of their possessions were not entirely theirs. Like they were still working to make the payments on the house, on their furniture, on their belongings. And so they essentially are homeless and they have no money. The mom has no job because she was a housewife. We learned that she never had any skills taught to her in school because she grew up very rich. And as a result, she went to finishing school and she was taught how to find a husband, how to conduct yourself like a lady in a public setting. But she wasn't taught things like clerical duties, typing, secretarial work, accounting. She wasn't taught any of those things. As a last resort, she writes a letter to her estranged mom and dad her estranged parents. We learn that the grandma accepts her and so they move into the grandparents' house. Now here's the catch. Apparently the grandfather doesn't know that this woman has kids. In order to maintain secrecy and re-establish good rapport with her dad, her mom, so their grandma, puts in place these conditions where the kids have to seclude themselves in this very unused wing of the house and they need to stay in the attic. Now the kids are like, this is so unfair, we want our life back, we want our mom back, and the mom is like, look, my parents hate me because I did something fucked up in the past, so we're gonna have to hide you for a while until I can get a job or convince your grandpa to love you because he doesn't know you exist, or biggest option is for us to wait for your grandfather to die. So while they're here, their grandma, who is a total like Christian Nazi, puts all these like rules in place. She says that she hates them, that they're spawns of the devil, that they should have never been born, and we're like, what the fuck? Anyway, so I'm gonna see what the hell's going on. I'm gonna try to keep this review largely spoiler free. Even though I'm gonna warn you about spoilers, I do need to say that I feel like it's pretty well known in pop culture that someone and someone do something that they are not supposed to do because they were secluded. Um, a lot of people were forced by their Christian grandmas to read this as children and... Y'all who read this shit as kids, this is really sad, messed up, psychological horror. Are you okay? 
Are you okay? Serious question. Are you okay? Did you like this book? Did you like this book when you read it back then? It's a very sad story about isolation and grief and not being wanted. Just like religious extremism. It's pretty intense. So I'm gonna continue reading and I will check in soon. Later that day. Okay, hi. So I've gotten a bit further into the book and we see that the mom's ultimate plan is to stay there as long as possible to inherit um, the inheritance. It's either the inheritance or she gets a job and takes them away. So that's one thing. But I also really love the writing and I also really love how VC Andrews puts you in the head of children who were forced to grow up too fast because since the mom can't be with them because she needs to be with the dad, make things go back to normal, convince the dad that she is their lovely little perfect daughter again, um, she barely gets to see her kids. So it's the job of Kathy, the main girl we follow, and her older brother Chris to act as surrogate parents to their younger siblings and they have barely any resources, the kids can't go outside. These young kids are like, we want to go to the garden, but they're like, no, we have to stay here. We see them coming to terms with the fact that young children are emotional beings who don't have access to their higher intellectual faculties. So seeing them struggle and find that in themselves, even there, like, okay, I emotionally don't want to be here, but logically I need to help my mom out. And seeing them reflect on that and realize their faults by seeing their younger siblings really makes you think about, you know, all the times you thought your parents were being unreasonable even though they were being lenient but trying to be protective of you and trying to explain difficult concepts to you in a way you couldn't grasp. So seeing that very insightful, psychologically incisive aspect to the story does lend it so much more power than I thought it would have. Like I'm seeing so much more in this read through than I had seen in the previous one because in the previous one I was expecting some salacious dirtiness. But over here, I'm really starting to see why it's such a good classic and why people love it so much. I'm an extreme horror reader, but I don't only read extreme horror. I love horror that delves into the darkness of the human mind and just seeing how dogmatic religious extremism can corrupt someone to the point where they hate their own grandchildren and can tell a child to their face, you should have never been born and seeing how a child internalizes such hate and bigotry at a young age is just so fucking good. I'm really digging this book so far. It's a very powerful story. The setting is incredible. When they're on their way to the grandparents' house and they just see the desolate landscape surrounding them and the wide open skies, it does evoke a sense of foreboding and dread and especially when they get into the house and just see how wide it is and how much of it they don't have access to which serves as a very sharp contrast to their very claustrophobic setting in the attic when they're just by themselves and it does also poke um critiques at religion like hereditary guilt like everyone is born with original sin yada yada and just because these kids were born from a mistake that their mom made shows that they're bad so it does have some commentary to it and does offer a lot of insight into religious trauma and people who grow up with it also there's this very orwellian aspect to it in how every single thing you do is seen like people monitor your every movement they monitor your thoughts like this grandma really imposes into their brains that she can see everything they do and if they even so much as think something naughty she's gonna punish them. Her threats of punishment are so horrific. She's gonna whip them, she's gonna scald them, she's gonna give them verbal lashings. It's super intense. Like, I totally see why this is classified as a horror book because it is terrifying, okay? Is it gory extreme horror that I'm used to? No. Is it effective, human, psychologically incisive horror? Yes. And it also really talks about how even the youngest siblings, the very young twins, have been robbed of their most formative years and rather than spend time in nursery playing, they're being verbally, abu verbally and physically abused by this towering, austere, angular-faced woman. And I really love how, from the point of view of Kathy, it just sounds so legitimately like a kid. Like, she describes her grandma as this witch and her grandpa as this ogre, and she sees the situation she's in as something like a fairy tale, like, you know, like a Hansel and Gretel thing. Despite being promised all this richness and wealth by the mom, seeing the situation, they're actually in and seeing how they rationalize and interpret this from the point of view of a child. It's just so freaking good. And I also really love how this book leans
comes into the aspect of generational trauma because there's a chapter where the mom gives her backstory, her personal backstory, and she refers to her mom, the kid's grandma, as a cruel person who just happened to give birth to me. And it gives you the idea that, yeah, just because you gave birth to someone doesn't mean you are a mother. In order to be regarded as a mother, you need to do all these other things besides just having pushed somebody out of your vag, you know? I'm actually annotating this book, and I got to this very beautiful line where Kathy describes her mood and her levels. She says, patience is gray, hope is yellow, but hope is fleeting and the days go by fast, but the time spent indoors is never ending. And that honestly perfectly described me during lockdown. I pretty much trauma blocked the entire pandemic from my head. But I remember the feeling I had of these like never ending days just locked at home. This book is just so relatable. Okay, I'm loving this book so far. And the kids are also finding it to be really unfair that the mom is having all this fun while they're just locked at home. And I felt that so hard during the pandemic when I was just locked at home seeing people on Instagram having fun lives. And I was like, this sucks. I'm just loving this book so far. There's just so much to it that I didn't think it would have. But seeing just how powerful and well-told and well-written and genuinely horrifying this story is, I am appreciating this book so much. I love it. I can't wait to see how it goes. I hear that it does get more tragic, but yeah, um, update soon. The next day. All right, hey everyone. Good morning. It is day two of this vlog and I have gotten 130 pages into Flowers of the Attic last night. So far, I can't really say I'm enjoying it because the subject matter of this book is just super tragic, but I can say that it is a very well-written book and a genuinely sad and scary experience for these people. Um, this is the kind of horror I like, the one that really focuses on the human realm and horrible things that human beings can do to one another. It's not that I get enjoyment out of this, it's just that this is what genuinely scares me. So we're gonna be reading this today, hopefully finishing it, and I will give updates when updates are needed. Check in soon. Two seconds later. So yeah, I also really love the aspect that deals with the kids' imagination. They've been locked up for so long that in order to escape the doldrums of the boredom of their existence, Kathy does ballet and imagines herself in this other place, this other place that makes her happier, this place that helps her escape her horrible existence. There's also another scene where they show that the kids are growing up too fast, and this was when they're playing hide and seek and the younger kid locks himself in like a trunk and almost dies from oxygen loss, and they're kids so they don't know how to revive him, so they're like, wake up, wake up, and they put him in a hot bath to like wake him up. It was just very scary, it was a very tense Scene, you know because anything can happen I mean this is a gothic horror book so kids dying is not something that is impossible in this story this book really captures the feeling of hopelessness boredom and isolation very well I also got to the part where it was Christmas and they were so desperate to win their grandma's affection despite all the abuse she's heaped on them so they make her this painting out of all these um, various materials and they give her the painting in, an, in hopes that she would accept it and accept them and sort of warm up to them and she just turns her back to them and slams the door and I felt really bad and you know who also felt really bad? Kathy. She was like, I've had enough of this bullshit, this crap shit bullshit. And she smashes the painting, she rips it apart, she jumps on it, she was like, this fucking old bitch! She smashes the painting. She doesn't say that, but the book does indicate that she cusses, so it's like, she probably did. I would say that. Well, I mean, I am a bitch that doesn't know how to, when to shut up, so this grandma would probably hear my thoughts. You know, in this case, they are small and they are brought up to be polite people in society. I'm like, I will fight. You and I will fight. So this scene where she finally snaps so late into the book did remind me so much of Jack Torrance in The Shining, which I also recently did a vlog on. The scene where Jack finally snaps in the book had the same power and the same weight as the scene where finally Kathy is like, our mom sucks, this grandma sucks, this situation sucks, it's never gonna change, fuck everyone, and I'm just like, damn. Later that day. Alright, so I was scared, I was anxious, but now I'm starting to get a bit uncomfortable because this book is going into some Blue Lagoon territory. If any of you have seen the film The Blue Lagoon with Brooke Shields when she was literally underage, 
that movie should be banned and everyone who made it should be thrown in jail. And why the fuck is that movie on Netflix? Make it make sense. So I'm saying Blue Lagoon territory because in that movie, I'm not gonna say what happens, but it's about kids on an island who do the dirty and they were literally underage at the time of production and it was just no. And wearing very, very minimal clothing, it was a thing that bothered me. Anyway, so in this book, they are not on an island, but they are in an attic. It's very uncomfortable reading about kids' experience, um, sexual curiosity for the first time, and try to answer these questions with themselves. It's just not, no, it's, it's just not fun. <laughs> and they're talking about puberty, they're talking about, um, zits and hair growing in places, and it's just like, I do not want to be reliving this moment in my life. Okay, what is happening? Also, I will say this, this book was obviously written by a woman, because if a man were to write this, I don't think there would be as frank discussions of menstruation and periods. Like when men tend to write women, they tend to write fantastical ideas of the idealized woman from their imagination in their head. But when a woman writes a woman, it seems more real and has more gravitas to it. So I'm appreciating this aspect of the story. I also really loved this quote that I actually annotated on this book and took note of when Kathy was desperately hoping the grandpa would die. And she said something like, Grandfather was on the way to heaven if gold counted, and on the way to hell if the devil couldn't be bribed. That was pretty sick. That was a good quote. The grandpa's super rich, and she's like, this motherfucker can preach all he wants, but like, I'll be shocked if he doesn't end up where the fire pits are, you know, this bitch. Really good quote. And then earlier in the book, I was talking about how much the grandma's um, brand of religion was very extremist, very cherry-picked, very hypocritical. And Kathy says she didn't see me as a whole person, but in sections that seemed to arouse her anger and she would destroy whatever made her angry. The grandma suspects that Chris, her older brother, is at that age where he's gonna start looking upon her with lascivious eyes. And so one day Kathy wakes up with tar in her hair and she's like, shit, do you hate me that much, bitch? Like, do you want me to cut this shit off that much? And the reason is because the grandma says that if Kathy doesn't cut her hair, she's gonna deprive them of food until Kathy cuts her hair. And at this point, the mom has not been visiting them. Like, she has been noticeably absent. Prior to this, she would visit them like once a day, but now she barely visits them anymore, and it's just really distressing and heartbreaking and fucked up and just not the vibe, you know? <laughs> Later that day. So I've gotten significantly further in. I am almost 300 pages into the book, and it is literally super sad. It is super tragic. This book reminds me so much of the movie, well, so far at least, I don't know how this book is gonna end, but this book is giving me the somewhat same feeling I had when I watched the movie Grave of the Fireflies and saw these two siblings in Japan during World War II have to live life without parents and fend for themselves, and you watch them getting weaker and they succumb to malnutrition and no love at all, and in a very unforgiving world that doesn't care about them. And this book reminds me so much of that movie, but instead of it being an anti-war message, it seems to be a critique on this religious, um, dogmatic way that the grandma is treating them. And there is more commentary. Like, when the grandma is comes in, Chris actually accuses her of locking them in a room with temptation and hunger, and it's like, you want to catch us doing something you consider evil. He tells that to the grandma. You, bitch, are literally setting us up to fail and looking for reasons to accuse us of failing with rules that you keep randomly adding that we can never obviously live up to given our situation. I don't want to say that it's a cathartic scene because they are still suffering, but it is a very powerful scene watching someone get called out and be unable to answer for themselves. Because like no normal person would want to treat these kids like this, but because of this grandma's worldview, it's messed up how ideas like this tend to warp the mind, you know? A few moments later. Alright, so I am on the last hundred pages of the book and I just got to a chapter called At Last Mama. And this is the chapter where the mom finally shows up and the kids are like, where the hell have you been? And she's like, look, I brought you all these toys. And the kids are like, bitch, you literally, you can't bribe us. You can't be like, I'm supplying shit for you, so please 
keep being abused. Like that is a very abusive parent-child relationship where some parents think that just because they pay for the child's shit means that they can treat the children like shit and I feel like that is what this book is trying to address. I have this theory. I feel like a lot of people who've given this book one star went in expecting a forbidden romance but ended up getting a very harsh, brutal book that deals with very complex and difficult ideas in a very frank way. We got to this really heartbroken scene where Kathy is literally showing the twins to the mom and saying, look, when we were this age, we grew like seven inches. These guys are barely growing. They're getting no sunlight. They're not getting enough food. You're starving them. You're abusing them. There was even a scene where they were being starved for weeks, so they had to eat mice, and Chris had to feed them his blood to give them protein, I guess, iron. And she's like, you literally cannot be out here just giving us toys and slowly killing us. Like, hello, woman, duh. It's a very sad book. I'm gonna try to finish this book today and I will check in once I have done that. Check in soon. Later that night. All right, so we have come to the end of the vlog and this is where the spoilers are gonna happen. So feel free to dip now if you don't wanna know how this book ends or what the grand finale is, but bitch, I need to go on a rant, okay? Like, yes. This book has the incest. I was like really shocked when that scene finally happened because there was so much tension. And can I just ask, um, a bunch of you who were telling me about this book said that you read this when you were children, which is very concerning to me as a person. Um, I don't have kids. I don't want kids. I'm never gonna have kids. But if a kid walked up to me and was like, should I read this book? I would yank it out of their hands and be like, no, go read Heartstopper. So yeah, the scene when the incest finally happens was very, very shocking, but that was something I had already known about before going into this book. The scene that really shocked me was when Corey, their younger brother, died. And the scene that shocked me even more was the fact that we find out in the end, ultimately, he died because the sugar donuts that were being given to them were laced with poison. That shocked me. And another thing that fucking shocked me was the ending chapter. I think it was called, hold on, I took notes. So near the end, there's this chapter called The Escape. So they had this escape plan where they took the mom's key while she wasn't looking and they pressed it into this bar of soap. And I think the brother somehow carved a piece of wood to get the key and they were gonna escape, right? So I was under the impression that they were gonna escape on this chapter, but no, 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 no. It's called the escape because when the brother escapes the room to get this, to get as much money and jewelry as he can to sell and for them to start a life on their own, dude, the mom apparently like left them. Like the mom and her new man, because she does marry a new man, left the kids, and apparently it's in the will, like in the will it was like, if we ever find out that she had had kids with somebody else, all this wealth that she had amassed is gonna be void, it's not gonna be hers anymore. So, bitch, when I found out that she like made a plan to kill her own kids, I was like, this bitch, bitch, th this is messed up. And what's even more messed up, I don't know about this author's life, but at the beginning of the book, when she was like, I dedicate this book to my mother, I was like, Okay, dedication, content of story. What's going on here? <laughs> Truly, what the hell did I just read? Also the scene when, um, what's her name? When Kathy slaps the mom back, that gave me life. I was like, finally, she's getting the chutzpah to punch back in the world. And I wish we'd seen more of that. Like I wish we'd seen um, more of a revenge or vengeance or retribution at the end because my main complaint, and this is why I'm not giving this five stars, is because the ending kind of just f felt very eh to me. Like the thing they said that they were gonna do, which is escape, is what they ultimately ended up doing. And I just felt that it ended on a very weak note considering the very dark and heavy rest of the story. I feel like it would have benefited from a more impactful ending. But then again, there are four more books in this series, and I hate to admit it, I'm actually really curious to see where the rest of this story goes. Now, will I have it in me to actually read 
the rest of this series? I don't think so. For those of you who have been following me for a long time and know what my tastes are, I want to know if you recommend this series to me. Because if enough people recommend this to me, I might continue physically reading it. But if that's not the case, I'll probably just spoil myself to see what happens, or check the movies out, or just... I don't know, we'll see. <laughs> but yeah, another scene that really got me was when Cory died and Kathy like made it her mission to be a good mother to her one remaining sibling, Carrie, and then she dreamed of that dream of Cory going to the dad in this like paradise place. That got me. Okay, that got me. This book was very emotionally powerful in a way that I didn't see coming, and I'm just like, what the actual fuck? I gave this book four stars. It was definitely not fantastical, okay? But it also wasn't the garbage that I thought that it was gonna be because I'd seen this book described as kitschy, salacious, tabloid, magazine, shallow stuff. As you can see from the rest of the vlog, it did have a lot to it that I wasn't expecting, and it did make me think, and I was annotating a lot of very beautiful passages. So yeah, um, if you've made it this far, which I highly doubt because these dedicated vlogs don't do well, leave a flower in the comments. Any flower, your favorite flower. A rose, a sunflower, a tulip, anything. Anyway, so with that being said, that's gonna do it. Like, comment, subscribe. Thank you, sir. Share this video with, um, fans of this book or comment down below what you thought and let's just talk about this book in a way, I guess. But yeah, I hope to see you in future videos and as always, take care. I lose myself